I don't really collect PCs like a lot of people do. You know, I've seen some garages stacked to the ceiling with 90s PCs that people find in the gutter, and I vibe with that, but it's never really been my thing uh, because I'm all about function, and functionally, PCs are all pretty similar. I mean, that's what's cool about the platform. Virtually any PC can be or do anything, but the downside is that it's hard to collect machines that really stand out. The function is almost always identical, so the only thing that really differentiates one PC from another is the shape. Uh, fortunately, I keep finding machines with strange shapes. This one here, for instance, is a Cybernet keyboard PC, uh, and as the name suggests, uh, it's a keyboard and a PC all in one box. If we look on the back here, there's uh, no question that this is a personal computer. I mean, there are some questions, but not whether it's a computer. Now, the uh, keyboard wedge design, as I call them, uh, was all over the place in the 80s. Uh, most of the well-known 8-bit home computers were built that way. But among IBM compatibles, it was pretty rare. I can almost list uh, every integrated keyboard PC off the top of my head, although I'm not going to. I'm going to read the teleprompter. Uh, they got made all over the place, uh, but it's still a pretty short list. Uh, the UK produced the Amstrad PPC 512 and 640, uh, as well as the Sinclair PC 200. Uh, VTech from Hong Kong produced the Laser Compact XT. Some Taiwanese company made a machine that got rebranded as the Head Start Explorer. And Ukraine, not Russia, like I accidentally said in an earlier video, produced the uh, Poyesk machines uh, that were popular in Eastern Europe. So that's everything I know of, and it's like seven machines, all of which had specs nearly identical to the original 1981 IBM PC. I think there were probably a, a few more, but no more than a dozen, from a decade when the PC in general was otherwise being cloned at an incredible pace. And even if more machines existed, they're all stupid rare now. I mean, all the ones I just listed, I've seen maybe one of each in the flesh ever. The exception was the Tandy 1000, uh, which came in two keyboard-based models, uh, the HX and EX. Uh, I've actually seen quite a few of those in person. I actually own one of those. Uh, but that's only because collectors love them, so they've all been preserved, uh, and because they were heavily sold here in the U.S. where I am. But even among the Tandy 1000 range, those models were less common than the plain beige box designs. And Who's surprised? I mean, the PC has always been defined as a big, ugly box full of expansion slots and flexibility, things a wedge can't offer. There's just no room to put them. So that's why I was surprised to learn that more than 10 years after the last wedge I was aware of left the market, someone actually dug the idea back up again. As far as I can tell, this is a singular achievement. Cybernet seems to be the only company that ever tried doing this after the 80s, and they actually kept doing it for a really long time, uh, which I'll touch on at the end of the video. Uh, but I recently found this one, uh, which appears to have been their first model, uh, and I honestly love the mix of kind of basic and kind of janky design that it has going on, so I wanted to share it with you. Let's take a look. Things don't look too wild at first. I mean, parts do, but... The keyboard is a totally conventional 104 key. Uh, in fact, it looks just like an IBM Model M. And to my great surprise, this is not just a cheap membrane design. There are actual Alps key switches under here. I didn't bring my cap puller, so I can't show you, but take my word for it. Uh, these are as clicky as anyone could hope for, uh, and it feels pretty reasonable to type on it. Although it does have some unpleasant flex going on. I'll show you why when I open it up, but you can actually kind of see it bowing even from above. So that's kind of a bummer, but still, this keyboard is essentially why I bought this thing. I'd known about Cybernet's PCs that were built this way for a while, but I'd never managed to find one for a good price. I mean, there's some on eBay, but they're like two, three hundred dollars. That's too much for a lark. So while I was excited when I came across this one at RePC, uh, it was in terrible condition. It had obviously been left in a shed. Uh, it was covered in dirt, uh, and all the exposed hardware was rusty. Uh, there's actually still a bit of rust still on here. I didn't notice there and there. So I worried that this had sat in a puddle for five years and maybe it didn't even work, but if it did, then I'd be getting a machine with a really nice built-in keyboard. So I went for it and fortunately it did clean up really nice. Uh, so anyway, from the top, the only real indicator that this isn't just a keyboard is that the LED area here is twice the size it should be because in addition to num lock, caps lock, and scroll lock lights, it also has power, turbo, and a hard drive light. 
I actually really like how subtly they integrated the PC and keyboard components. Uh, this is a respectable, professional looking device that would look good on a desktop. Uh, or it did anyway before someone spray painted stuff on it. Uh, from these sloppy red letters, you can infer this came from a school because only institutions brutalize PCs in this way. Uh, you can also tell from the enormous hasp that they glued to the bottom so they can chain it down to a lab desk. Uh, I got this machine at RePC, which is a local Seattle store, so it stands to reason that CWU was Central Washington University, although it made quite the trip to get here before finally being thrown away. So the top may look normal, uh, but from the uh, sides or the back, it's pretty clear something's amiss. This thing is about two inches thick, and that's an important thing to discuss because Cybernet really could have shot themselves in the foot here, and it's to their credit that they didn't. Consider the keyboards on uh, popular American home computers, like the Commodore 64 here and uh, the Apple II. I've complained about keyboards from this era of computing before because uh, the keys are imprecise, they're jam prone, uh, they're very heavily sprung, um, sometimes they don't even have proper switches underneath, and they're really hard to touch type on. But more importantly, the keys float really high off the desk. This is like a good two inches across the board, and the uh, Apple II is like a good three or four inches. It's just soaring. So to type on these, you have to hover your hands in midair. You can't really eh, rest them anywhere. It doesn't give you a good angle on the keyboard. Now, I've been told that in general, my complaints aren't really valid. That in their day, these were seen as unusually nice keyboards, partly because a lot of people using these were coming from typewriters, uh, which worked very differently from what we're used to now. Uh, typewriters had no concept of touch typing as we know it, uh, and they also had very high floating keyboards with an extremely long key travel. So the keyboards on these computers weren't really that bad for their time. The Cybernet, however, came out in 1999, as far as I could tell, at which point most people with computer experience had been touch typing for over a decade on IBM style keyboards. So if this one floated two inches off the desk, it would have been unusable, but fortunately, Cybernet avoided that. The chassis sides are sloped pretty aggressively, so the front edge of the keyboard actually sits pretty close to the desk. It is taller than a normal keyboard, but if you put like a, a foam wrist rest in front of this, you'd never notice. The slope of the chassis also angles the keys, uh, like the feet on a normal keyboard, uh, and that allows the back panel to be tall enough to fit all the I.O. ports. For 1999, these ports are exactly what you'd expect. We've got a parallel port, two serial ports, VGA, and then below that, a PS2 mouse port uh, and built-in Ethernet, uh, which is actually pretty surprising for a machine of these specs, as you'll find out. Uh, there's no PS2 keyboard port, and I think we can guess why that is. So that half of the back is pretty straightforward. The other one raises some questions. There's an expansion slot down here, uh, which I think most people wouldn't have expected for a weird small form factor PC, especially of this era. But what's with this cable looping out and back into the machine? And what's with the cutout above it? And why is there an ATX power harness hanging out of it? Why is the port labeled power in just an empty hole? you can tell something terrible happened here. It was me. I was the terrible thing. So yeah, I could turn this machine on at this point, but as soon as I do that, it'll just turn into a PC and become boring. So let's not turn it on yet and instead open it up so I can explain the various crimes inside, both mine and Cybernet's. The keyboard itself serves as the case lid uh, and it comes apart with six screws, uh, three in the back and three in the front, uh, minus the one I lost, so let's get those out. To remove the keyboard safely, uh, we have to lift it up partway and unhook the first cable, which is plugged in here, and that, of course, is not keyed or labeled in any way, so better hope you remember how it goes. Uh, then we lift it up a little further, and we can get this guy out, and that one fortunately is key. I can now show you how this keyboard is built, uh, and unfortunately, it's not very well built. There's no metal backing plate back here like you'd find in a, a really decent keyboard, so it's not very rigid. Uh, in fact, it's really just the circuit board itself and then this uh, flimsy 
plastic frame, uh, and it's held in place only by these screws around the perimeter. And these ones actually do go through the plastic, but these ones just have these built-in washers. They're just kind of overlapping. Uh, and they weren't actually wide enough from the factory. So these ones held it kind of okay. Uh, but if I push down on the space bar, you can actually see the whole damn thing flexes just horribly. And so uh, when I first had this thing, if I pressed space a little aggressively, it would actually pop over these screws and get stuck uh, under the uh, frame. So I'd have to take it all apart to, to fix it. So I actually had to put these great big ugly washers on here to correct that and it still has way too much flex in it. So that's kind of a bummer, but it wouldn't be that hard to fix. But anyway, let's now turn to the actual guts of the machine and uh, I've got some splaining to do. This is not how it came from the factory. Uh, I've applied a couple mods, uh, partly out of necessity, partly just because YOLO. Uh, but let's start with what's actually supposed to be here. The motherboard is just this square here, and I've had this completely out of the machine, uh, but I won't be doing it again because it's a huge pain in the ass, so just take my word for this. I've looked all over it, and I can't find any identifying marks. It's not made by anybody, and it has no name or model number. Uh, I strongly suspect that it's actually bespoke, like a laptop motherboard that's made for this specific chassis. Notice how it fits perfectly inside the outline of the keyboard size chassis. That's not by accident. Uh, the ISA slot on the left and the drive ports on the right only make sense inside this exact case as well. Uh, and by 1999, it wasn't hard to get a low-end custom motherboard made. Cybernet probably just went to some ODM and placed a minimum order for 5,000 boards or whatever. And this is a very low-end machine. Even for 1999, the specs are not great. Uh, it shipped with a Pentium 233 MMX at a time when Pentium 2s and 3s were commonplace. So it was two generations behind the times. Although to be fair, the P2 and the P3 were enormous chips that never would have fit in here anyway. Also, it's not really fair to call a Pentium MMX a Pentium. They really are different chips. Um, this is two generations of silicon newer than the Pentium that came out in 1993. Uh, it was sort of Intel's uh, Celeron option if even a Celeron was too expensive in 1999. Now it doesn't actually have that original chip uh, because of well, let's just roll the crappy smartphone footage. It really speaks for itself. What you just heard was the CPU fan that came on this thing. Uh, the bearings were cached, and unfortunately, uh, the heatsink fan unit was glued to the CPU, uh, which was the style of the time. I muscled it off with a screwdriver, uh, but it left tons of residue behind, so I figured I'd just go down to RePC and get a whole new CPU and sync. I figured they must have a whole bunch of them or an old machine that I could pull one out of. Unfortunately, every single chip that I found also had a permanently attached sync, and uh, either their fans were failing or they were way too tall for the case. See, the uh, original unit was very low profile. It can't really be any thicker than this. Uh, everything else I got that was taller than that ran into the bottom of the keyboard and shorted it out. So what I ended up doing uh, was getting one of the few chips there that didn't have a heat sink at all. Uh, and then I used thermal tape to stick the heat sink unit from an ancient AMD GPU on there, which is why I have the only Radeon powered Pentium machine. I suspect any CPU faster than 233 megahertz wouldn't survive with this thermal solution, but this seems to work okay. Now I also had to replace the BIOS battery. It originally had one of those uh, heat shrunk uh, CR2032 cells with soldered on wires, uh, which was impossible to replace. Uh, so I ended up buying some of these little uh, battery holders online uh, and just soldering that onto the old header uh, and that worked fine. Uh, the holder also has a little switch built in in case I wanna reset the CMOS, which I never would on this machine. But other than those uh, minor changes, the motherboard itself is pretty much stock, and it's also pretty ordinary. Uh, it has an SIS 5571 chipset. Um, there's some, you know, typical wind bond chips. I didn't even look up what those are. Uh, it's got an award BIOS. It has a Realtek Ethernet chip, uh, which initially surprised me since built-in Ethernet seemed exotic for a Pentium. But again, 
This is really a 1999 era PC that just had a then current budget line CPU. Um, the 64 meg of RAM uh, in Sims up here also seems uh, pretty remarkable for a Pentium machine, but again, not very impressive in 1999. Of course, since the board is a custom small form factor design, it does have some odd things going on. Uh, for instance, there are parts mounted on the back. Here's a photo because I did not want to pull this out again. That's something you see on laptops, but almost never on desktop boards, but it makes sense here. Uh, there's also this weird little flying bridge here that seems to have a, a voltage regulator, I'm guessing. It's got capacitors, it's got transistors, it's got a choke. Uh, now, power supplies of this era didn't provide the very important 3.3 volts that CPUs crave, so I'm pretty sure this is spinning 5 volt straw from the power supply into 3.3 volt gold. Uh, the amount of heat that it's dissipating certainly suggests it's a linear regulator. And my guess is that this would have been on the board itself, but they just plumb ran out of space, uh, probably due to the size of the RAM slots, which had to be exactly here. So this sits on a daughter board, covering up the uh, graphics chip down there. That's like a chips and technologies, something or other, completely ordinary sludge for the era. Uh, so this guy is sitting on a pin header over here that connects it to the board. Uh, and it was originally uh, glued on here with a huge blob of hot glue. So I kind of think this was probably a late addition to the design. Probably also due to the limited board space, uh, the only ports that are mounted to the motherboard are the PS2 uh, and the ethernet. Everything else is on this separate PCB that's bolted to the back, and then it connects to the motherboard with not one, but two separate ribbon cables. So I kind of think they must have stuck this into the design very late and just had to sort of stuff things where they could fit them because, boy, that's, that's pretty janky. But honestly, it's not unreasonable uh, for a one-off compact board design. The storage situation is pretty reasonable. Uh, we've got a low profile floppy drive, uh, like what you'd find in a laptop, uh, which actually also has a little bit of rust going on, but uh, it does actually work, or I should say, it did work. Um, it hooks up with one of these little Mylar ribbons that you find in laptops and stuff, and I actually managed to tear it. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little tiny rip and just a couple conductors. Uh, I don't think this drive is proprietary, but the cable is, so it's going to be pretty tough to replace, uh, and that made it a lot harder to get files on and off the system. Although, fortunately, it does have Ethernet, and since I installed a proper operating system on here, I'm actually able to move files that way. But if I ever trash the OS, I'll have a hard time recovering it. And we do, of course, have a hard drive. Uh, this is a typical 2.5-inch IDE laptop unit uh, with a capacity of 2 gigabytes. Again, that'd be big for a Pentium 66 machine, but it was peanuts for 1999. Uh, the laptop style 44 pin interface here uh, actually uses this little dinky cable here to hook up. And this is actually a nice feature because this allows the hard drive to get its power directly through the motherboard instead of having an extra flying lead uh, that would have to be stuffed into the case here and take up more space. There is a standard 40 pin IDE header next to it, and I can't quite figure that out. I'd hoped that I could use that to temporarily hook up a CD-ROM, like take the case off, put the CD-ROM next to it, and plug it in. But for some reason, uh, neither the CD-ROM or the hard drive will show up when I do that, even if I move the jumpers around. And that made loading an OS a real pain. My ultimate solution was to just pull the hard drive out so I could hook it up to my PC with a USB adapter and then move the contents of the Windows 98 install disk over. Uh, but that's when I found out that this hard drive was dead. That horrifying screech was the motor's pulse width modulation circuitry freaking out because the disc spindle's jammed and it can't get it to move. It's common for the oil to dry out in hard drives this old uh, and freeze the platters in place, but if you're lucky, it doesn't mean the drive is dead for good. And sure enough, after a couple power cycles, the damn thing actually spun up and mounted. You gotta be shitting me. I've recovered a few drives this way. Uh, I actually had one that was stuck so hard that I had to put a wrench on the spindle and break it loose. I didn't film that, but it made a cracking noise that hurt my ears. And afterwards, there was a flat spot in the bearing. You can kind of see it here in this clip. It spins, and then it hits a dry spot and stops. I had to give it a dozen turns or so to spread the oil around, but then, sure enough, that drive actually mounted as well. 
although it did struggle to come up to speed for a bit. So this hard drive is in good working order now, but if it wasn't, I'd just replace it with any old laptop drive. It's nothing special. And uh, with that, yeah, there you go. That's most of the innards that actually shipped in this machine. And you know, it's again, really just a PC like any other. It's got all the same parts as a compact from 1998. They've just been Clive Barker body horrored into a weird shape. They do the same stuff as the machine you had with the round domed power button and the turbo LEDs. Speaking of turbo, uh, there's a light on the keyboard for turbo, but I have no idea how to toggle it. I just realized that while shooting the video, uh, I haven't found a jumper on the board anywhere for it, and that'd be kind of weird. There's no switch, obviously. Um, maybe there's a key combo. That's how some machines did it. Uh, maybe there's just a setting in the BIOS. I haven't checked. When we turn it on later, I'll, I'll take a peek. But uh, since the manual for this thing is long gone, I'm not likely to ever find out how I was supposed to do that otherwise. Compared to a normal PC, the weirdest thing about this is the power supply situation. PCs in this era all used big, chunky ATX PSUs like uh, this one, uh, but the Cybernet actually came with this guy inside, and obviously that's considerably smaller, but that's because this is really about a third of a power supply. This uh, originally went right up here, and uh, you know, this machine used its space pretty efficiently as things go, but there was just no way to fit an entire ATX supply into this part of the chassis. Maybe nowadays with a good budget, uh, somebody could pull that off, but in a cheap machine from 1999, it was never gonna happen. So all the conversion of wall current into useful semiconductor voltages had to happen outside of the machine. So it originally came with a power brick that turned 110 or 220 volt wall current into much gentler electrons. And then that plugged into this unit here, which converted it down even further to get the remaining voltages that PCs crave. So naturally when I bought the machine, it didn't include that brick and I had to figure out how to replace it. Now, I am not a smart man, so while the label on the back very clearly says that it takes 12 volts at 5 amps and minus 12 volts at 1 amp, uh, I somehow misread that. I thought it was gibberish, some sort of punctuation confusion. I don't know, but there's something wrong with me. But even if I had understood it, it wouldn't have helped because this uses a connector that all hobbyists hate to see. This guy right here, which Nobody really has a reliable name for. Uh, it's the round four pin thing that's not DIN. Uh, it usually has a latching collar on it. They're awful. When you see one, it's always weird. It's never something simple. It's like 12 volts at an uncomfortably high amperage or 24 volts at two amps or a mix of like 12 and five volts. It's really inconvenient forms of power that you can't readily source. Uh, and worse, you know, as we see here, there's no pinout listed back here. So even if you know what the voltages are, you don't know where to put them. And if you guess wrong, you fry the device or the power supply or both. So I went at this very carefully. Uh, this connector here is what plugs into the motherboard itself. And I figured each one of these wires uh, was gonna be one of the normal PC voltages. Uh, and I knew uh, that the inputs here uh, probably took plus 12 and minus 12 because those are two of the standard rails in PCs of the era. It would make sense to derive the other voltages from those. And sure enough, um, I figured out where to put the voltage on these pins. It went straight through to the plug. And then I found that the uh, circuitry here derives plus five and minus five volts from that as well. So I figured everything out, but um, I didn't have high amperage plus and minus 12 volt supplies handy, just a, a bench supply. Uh, and I also didn't entirely trust this cheap 30 year old DC converter. You know, it could short out and dump 12 volts into both of my five volt rails. I didn't really want to use it. But since the converter did plug into the board using an ordinary AT plug, I figured, well, maybe I can just use a normal AT supply. So if we look at these side by side, the plugs themselves look identical and they've even got the two black wires on the left side. So you could convince yourself that maybe they just got the color code wrong, but otherwise it's the same thing. Fortunately, I've been around the block once or twice and I knew not to blindly trust this. And yeah, as it turns out, it's just about as wrong as it could possibly be. 
If the pinout of this plug was completely different than this one, then that might be okay. I mean, it, it wouldn't be, not really, but it might be, okay? Instead, they took the normal pinout, which goes uh, roughly, don't, don't assume that I'm right here. Look this pinout up if you're doing something with this, okay? I, I, I probably wrote this down wrong. Ground, ground, minus 12, plus 12, plus five, minus five. And they basically reversed just the hot leads. So instead of putting the grounds on the other side, they just moved around the hots. So this is more like ground, ground, plus five, minus five, minus 12, plus 12. It's just about as wrong as it could be. Plugging in an AT supply would have cooked this machine. Additionally, I maybe could have just gotten an AT supply and repinned the plug. You just, uh, you take the connector here and uh, you push a screwdriver, a very thin screwdriver up into the slots here and you can pop the pins out and move them around. But it turns out that most AT power supplies are dead. Uh, they're full of old capacitors, which is already a problem with most computer stuff, but these ones tend to have a kind called a reefa cap. And when you apply power to a dried out reefa, they crackle, they hiss, and then they explode violently, uh, often damaging the device. And sure enough, every AT supply I found at RePC, including this one, either crackled and hissed or output nothing. So I had to find a power supply that wouldn't desmokeify when I turned it on, and that meant that it had to be ATX. Now, the ATX spec provides all four voltage rails that AT machines needed, but ATX motherboards in practice didn't actually need them all. So pretty quickly, manufacturers decided that the minus five volt rail wasn't useful and they got rid of it. Now, my understanding is that that won't stop an older PC from running for the most part, but it will prevent certain add-ons from functioning, like the Sound Blaster, which I was intent on using. So I had to go through every power supply at RePC until I found one with a functioning minus five volt, which ended up being this guy here. See, there it is. It's not much current, a half an amp, but it's there. Now, of course, this is too new to have AT style plugs that I could just, you know, repin. So instead, I dug up an ATX extension cable, chopped it in half, I got an AT plug, and I spliced the two together and then fed that through the knockout on the back. I have no idea what that knockout is for, by the way. I, I was really hoping when I got this thing that this would just would just happen to fit in there, snap into place, but it doesn't. It's just a little bit too wide. Huge bummer. I was so sad. But uh, it at least is accessible from the outside, so I can take this guy and just plug it in right there. Now, since this is an ATX power supply, it doesn't just turn on. Uh, it needs a power on signal. Uh, so I had to add one to the machine. So I just hot glued this random piece of detritus in here. Uh, and I soldered that to green and one of the ground wires and Bob's your uncle. There you go. This thing's ATX now. So yeah, um, this worked. I solved the problem. See, I can run the machine now. This, this is convenient with the power supply hanging out the back. Look, I know this is an absurd solution, but it required the smallest amount of brain power, which is at a real premium for me, so I went with it. Now, with the old supply gone, of course, uh, the fan hole on the back uh, was empty, and I thought that was unsightly. And at this point, I was also thinking to myself, as much as I like the shape of this machine, you know, that's why I got it, I'm putting in a lot of effort here to get this working, but I can't think of a reason I'd ever turn it on again. I mean, sure, it's a tchotchke, it's a conversation piece, but it's gonna be exactly like six other machines I already own. What would make me pull this one out and plug in a monitor and power and actually turn it on? So I wanted a way to differentiate it. And I realized I have this problem where I just can't keep computer speakers around. I don't know why, but for the last decade, I've never been able to find a pair of plain old amplified speakers when I need them. So if I wanna to listen to some FM jams on a real sound blaster, I don't usually have a way to do it. So I decided to give this thing a built-in sound system. I'd already put in this uh, sound blaster Vibra 16 that I just had laying around. Uh, and I went out to a couple thrift stores uh, and I came home with uh, one of those awful iPod themed portable speaker sets. Maybe I can find a picture on Google Images, but maybe not. There'll be some funny text up there if I, if I can't find one. Uh, this cost me about three bucks. Uh, I gutted it, I pulled out the speakers and the amp, and I just uh, 
hot glued them into the chassis. They're just, they're just stuck down there. Uh, then I looped the input cable out the back to plug into the sound card. It's ugly, uh, it could be done better, but it works. Now you'd think that putting the speakers inside this would make the sound all muffled and awful, but I had a plan. One speaker is glued to the empty fan hole at the back, so it actually has a clear path to the outside world, uh, and the other one is stuck to the bottom of the case facing up. That seems like an L, but it's actually all part of my keikaku. Uh, see, this keyboard doesn't actually sit flush to the case. It actually rides on these standoffs. See, so there's a, a quarter inch gap between the keyboard and the case. So I figured that if I put the one speaker on the bottom firing upwards, it would kind of hit the bottom of the keyboard and splash out all around the sides. Now I, I should mention, I'm pretty sure the machine didn't come this way. Uh, the one other person that I've seen ever talk about this was Foon on Twitter, uh, but the pictures they posted of a clearly identical, albeit rebranded version, show no gap. The keyboard just sits flush to the case. I think that's probably how this thing came. I guess that the standoffs were added by university IT staff because without them, the only cooling for the whole machine would be from the little dinky power supply fan struggling to pull air through the power supply and then through this little vent uh, in the front of the case. And uh, sure enough, even with the standoffs, with the machine running, I've noticed that there's heat just gushing out from this gap. So I suspect that from the factory, these things overheated like mad. So I think this mod was probably necessary. And uh, you know, since the gap was there, I took advantage of it and it actually worked. Uh, so I'm gonna pop this thing back together. I'm gonna hook it up and I'll see if I can demo that. All right, so we've got it all put back together now and we can turn it on. So like I said, uh, this is just a PC. So we get the award BIOS, we get the Energy Star logo, uh, we get the memory test. Wow, it didn't say updating ESCD. I, I, don't, I don't know why. The last five times I started this thing, it said updating ESCD. It didn't say verifying DMI pool data, so. I guess this is different from all the other PCs I have. Anyway, it's starting Windows 98 right now, which for some reason just takes eons. And I, I know it's a Pentium 266, but it, what's it doing? The hard drive shut off. Like it's a laptop hard drive. So it, it, it shuts off and, and, and returns the heads when it's not reading anything. And so during boot, it just hits this point where it just swings the heads in and just stops for like 20 seconds. What could it be doing? So yeah, uh, I put Windows 98 on here, you know, it's Windows 98. We get the sound. Uh, and it's really just here so I can more easily get files onto the machine. I don't particularly wanna run any Windows software on this thing, but uh, the fact that it has ethernet and this has Internet Explorer means that I can get files onto the machine by just hosting them on a website and then downloading them through that. And it saves a lot of time compared to putting floppies into the machine over and over, especially if your floppy drive is broken, uh, or pulling the hard drive out, which takes about 30 minutes because you have to disassemble the entire machine and completely gut it to get the hard drive out. And there's no way to plug into it with it in there. So this is really just for convenience. The real excitement is in DOS, but we knew that. All right, so first off, we'll do the usual thing. We'll fire up a video game. Uh, now. An awful lot of stuff is actually off the table. Uh, nearly everything is content ID'd at this point. You'd think that DOS video games would be safe, but uh, the Wacky Wheels soundtrack has gotten my live streams flagged like three times. So I'm gonna go with one of the few games uh, that I haven't had any trouble with. And hopefully I, I don't just cut out the next part of this video when it gets content ID'd. If the next part of this video is missing, then you'll know it got content ID'd and I had to remove it. Every single time I start this game, since I was six years old, I have typed M Striker instead of Striker. Why is there no sound? There should be sound right now. Why is there no sound? There was sound before. Hello, computer? Oh, you know what? I forgot. I was gonna get into the BIOS and see if there's a turbo control in here. Let's, let's find out. Uh, nothing there. That's completely ordinary. 
Uh, oh, look at that. Boot up system speed, high or low. I'll bet that's it. So right now the turbo light's on. If I set that to low and come back and save an exit, it's still on. Let's, uh, let's get to DOS. Let's see if it stays on. Still turbo. All right, let's, uh, let's power cycle it. Man, I don't know. That turbo light is still on. I think I'm probably right that you either have to use a key combo that I don't know, or you've got to run a program to change your turbo status. Uh, I know that the Tandy 1000 machines, I think, did that. Uh, the Head Start machine I have does that. Uh, I, I, I want to say, I want to say some of the IBMs did that. It's a pretty common thing. So that's probably what what's going on here. You know what? Did I turn I turned the music off in the game? For the last 10 minutes, I've been trying to figure out why there was no music. It's because I turned the music off the last time I was playing the game. That ride symbol has killed me since I was six years old. I've been dead since I was six years old because of that ride symbol. All right, let's restart and do it again, properly this time. I don't know how this comes across in the video, but in person, it sounds shockingly decent. Uh, despite the crappy iPod speakers and the incredibly dumb acoustic cabinet that I've designed here, I think my idea about sound squirting out around the keyboard was actually valid. It really seems to actually fill the room. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's pretty cool, but I'm sick of every Sound Blaster demo being the same handful of DOS video games. So I wanted to play something else and uh, I was hoping to play one of the many great songs uh, that come with AdLib Tracker, but uh, I tried uploading a clip of this machine playing one of those to my side channel a couple weeks ago and it got content ID'd. Uh, and I was later informed that it was actually a cover of a Jan Hammer song that I'd never heard of before. There's really no margin on this stuff anymore. You just can't play anyone else's music in your videos. So uh, I spent uh, two hours teaching myself AdLib Tracker and composed my own music. So don't be too harsh. This is literally the first song I've ever written.
So yeah, uh, despite the material, I think this thing sounds surprisingly good. Hopefully that came across in the recording. Uh, now I haven't added a volume control to it yet, uh, but I will eventually. And then I think I might actually set this up at a gathering someday to play music, which like I said, gives it more of an actual function in my life than any other old PC I have. So mission accomplished. There is however, one notable issue with it. Here's AdLib Tracker again, but look closely. See this line? It's sorta of warbling. There is something wrong with the power rails in this machine. Something is fluctuating and making the graphics chip do something wrong. I don't really know what exactly, but each horizontal line of video seems to jitter uh, left and right randomly at all times. Uh, and it changes depending on what the system's doing. At first, I thought it was caused by bad shielding because uh, I was using AdLib Tracker a lot. So uh, I thought it was audio leaking over from the Sound Blaster's amplifier, but I pulled the card and it was still there. Uh, so I did some experimenting and I realized that uh, actually the wobbling gets better when AdLib Tracker is playing. See, if I hit the button, the warbling actually decreases. So that's not it. Uh, and then I found that there are things that don't involve sound at all that are even worse. So let's uh, reboot into Windows on purpose this time. So once we're at the desktop, everything looks okay at first. Like we've got this Explorer window open and uh, the edges of it seem nice and clean. Nothing's happening. But now let's move that window and it turns into like a 90s music video. It's a total disaster. Uh, and similar things happen if I do anything uh, that updates the whole screen. Like if I open the start menu, every time I do that, it causes this sort of tearing effect all over the screen. Uh, I also found that file copy operations exacerbate it. At one point I was copying a folder with a ton of little tiny files and the ripple just got worse and worse until the screen lost sync. Uh, for about three minutes. And then when the copy was done, it just came back. The wildest effects happen if I try and play a video. Uh, I've got some stuff here uh, that came on the Windows 98 CD. So if we open one of these up. So not only is the screen ripple really intense, but the audio is distorted as well. Gamers, it's finally here. The controller with all the right moves. Any way that you move controls the moves within the game. It's the Microsoft Sidewinder Freestyle Pro. And uh, if I maximize it, the situation gets even worse. It's so bad now that you can actually see it in the dark areas of the screen. Even the black pixels are being distorted uh, and the audio is absolutely trashed. Three challenging new courses with stunning graphics on every shot. Try it on a floor swing. And use recommended power reaction this swing to find the optimal location to end your backslide. Now, what's really intriguing here is if I minimize the video, the audio plays just fine in the background and the screen ripple goes away almost completely. So it looks like this is largely tied to CPU load. Although even stranger, if I pull the video up and hit Alt Enter, which apparently puts it in exclusive full screen mode, which I didn't even know it did on Windows 98, it all suddenly runs a lot more smoothly and the sound is fine. Keeps against anyone in the world when you meet your match on the internet gaming zone. Uh, I have no idea why this is apparently easier on the hardware, nor do I know why the color palette is all trashed, but there's definitely some mysterious things going on here. With this being seemingly tied to a combination of system load and hard drive activity, the most likely culprit is bad power, but I'm not sure where it would be. I don't think it's the external PSU. Uh, at first I distrusted it, because like I showed you earlier, it was this 22 year old off brand model, but I got a chance to try another one. See, when I was uh, setting up for this video, the machine stopped booting all of a sudden. It was working and then it got glitchy and then it started just randomly rebooting and I, I couldn't even make it to a Windows desktop. Uh, and I figured that that power supply was starting to fail. So I went over to RePC and I dug around until I found a much newer supply from a real brand. Uh, this is a, a thermal take. Is it thermal take? Is it thermal? Somebody, somebody told me once it was thermal talky. I, I don't know. Anyway, this actually has uh, the 2024 pin so this is fairly modern. It's got a PCIe, there we go. It's got PCIe six pin power. Uh, and yet it still has the minus five volt rail. So yeah, I was shocked. I didn't think anyone made power supplies with that after like 2002. So I was excited to get this. I figured it might fix my problem. 
Uh, then, on my way back to the studio, my girlfriend informed me that she had opened the machine up and found that the shitty battery holder I'd installed was laying on top of the VRM and one of the screws was shorting out a couple of the pins. Uh, she pulled it out and the machine started working again. So, yeah, I guess I should have taped over those. Uh, but still, I had this much newer power supply, so I tested with that and no dice. Same ripple. Uh, and I'd also tested with my bench power supply at home uh, with the original voltage converter that came with the machine and there was ripple there too. So even if there was something wrong with both these supplies, it wouldn't be the exact same problem happening with this totally different thing uh, running off of my extremely clean bench power supply. So it's not the power input, it's got to be something about the board. So I tried recapping uh, the voltage regulator and that did Nothing. Uh, so either there's a bad cap in there that I missed, uh, or there's a failing semiconductor in uh, the voltage regulator, or I guess maybe this machine just sucks. Maybe it was like this when it was new. I mean, I mean, who knows? It was sold to a pretty low end of the market. Maybe it just never worked. I don't know. I'm not sure how to fix this. Uh, and you know, for the tasks I want to do with it, the ripple doesn't really seem to hurt anything. Um, and I don't want to destroy the machine trying to fix it. So I think I'm just gonna let it be weird. And if it actually stops working, then I'll worry about it then. Uh, and with that said, we're done with this machine. That's what it does. Uh, that's how it does it. That's what I'm doing with it. Uh, there's not much more to say, but I do have some further comments on the people who made it. This was not the last keyboard PC that Cybernet made, not by a long shot. They kept making them with upgraded hardware for years and years. Uh, the first one I ever saw actually was a Pentium 4 model that my friend CompGeek showed me. Uh, this video was supposed to be about that one originally and it was supposed to be shot two years ago, but he's put off mailing it to me for so long that in the intervening time, I found one in the wild, repaired and modded it and completed an entire video about it. So I guess he doesn't need to send me the other one anymore. But even that P4 wasn't the last model they made. They continued making them under the name ZPC, or Zero Footprint PC, throughout the 2000s and into the 2010s. Uh, the latest model I could find was the ZPC H6, which shipped in 2012 with a second gen i5. And it seems like that's when they finally bailed on the whole idea. Uh, the company still exists, but they've pivoted to more specialized, small outline PCs for enterprise applications. But they were in this market for over a decade and you've probably never heard of the company or known that anyone made an all-in-one keyboard PC after the 80s and the reason for that is probably that it's not a very good idea. I, I mean, sure, it, it saves space, but we've had PCs the size of paperback books since the early 2000s. If you want a really tiny machine and you don't care what the specs are, there's lots of solutions that don't force you to use a built-in keyboard that you can't replace when you spill a drink in it. And besides, for the last 20 years, people have solved this problem not with tiny desktop PCs, but with laptops. Those come with built-in screens and speakers that save even more space. Hell, they even have a little uninterruptible power supply built in. I've been mad that desktops don't have those for years. Given that laptops got so cheap at the low end such a long time ago, it must have been really hard to make the argument for a system like this. And certainly after 2010, which is probably why Cybernet gave up around that time. Up until that point, it, it maybe made sense to someone, but $300 laptops with i5s and, and Chromebooks and smartphones obliterated this poor thing's market for sure. I can't deny that I find myself drawn to weird machines like this. The form factor just tickles me, but I think this video speaks for itself. The reason you don't see systems like this is because nobody really wants a system like this, except for the aesthetics. And sadly, that's always been a bad reason to choose a PC. Otherwise, you better believe I'd be rocking a Toshiba Quasmio right now. But anyway, uh, that's all I got for today. I want to thank you all for watching. It means a lot. Uh, and if you enjoyed this, it would be cool if you could subscribe. It helps me make those magic numbers go up and maybe turn on notifications if you want to keep up with new videos. Uh, but if you really liked this, then consider signing up for my Patreon. Every dollar I get on there ends up making my channel better. Trust me, without all these folks helping me out, this video wouldn't exist because I wouldn't have bought this filthy, rusty, broken machine on a whim. Uh, they're also why I have a studio and an overhead camera and why I bought five crappy laptops in the last two weeks solely so I can tell all of you what makes them weird. I can't thank my patrons enough for making all that possible. To everyone else, thanks for watching.